Hey, Sana. Can you hear me well? Oh, uh, yes, I can hear you well. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and get started? Yep. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, good evening. Good Good morning, depending on which part of the world you're joining here from. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some time to talk about who I am, what I do, what my journey has been, um, and then open it up to questions so that we can have more of an interactive session. And um, feel free to ask any questions and any comments that you might have. Um, the more questions there are, you know, I can directly address it, make it more of a personalized interactive session. So yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Priyanka. I am a STEM mentor, a biomedical engineer, a clinical researcher, and uh, recently an autocross car racer, apparently. Uh, we can talk more, more about that. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought I'll divide this talk into three parts. So the first one where I'll talk about my experiences as a woman in STEM, and this will be my education and the work that I do. So that way it's kind of um, covering both of those together. And then I'll talk about a little bit about my mentorship and volunteer activities, all of the things that I do as a mentor and how people who are interested can get involved in all of this. And then finally, I'll talk about advice for the next generation in STEM. So I'll try to keep it brief, maybe for about 10 minutes, and then we can open it up to questions. So starting off, um, I did my undergrad in biotechnology engineering from Sir MBIT, which is in Bangalore. This happened between 2010 and 2014. Now that's a four year program, of course. Um, I thought it was important. And again, this would be something that I would definitely encourage people to think about is to always wanting to you know, supplement your, your education with, with additional internships, even though it's not prescribed in the syllabus. I think the more we try to stick to that, it, it doesn't work. You have to kind of go out there, um, you know, get your feet a little wet to be able to learn all of these, these different techniques that you might not be learning in college. So year one was an internship at um, the Harvard Medical School, which was an internship in a biomedical engineering lab. Um, it involved doing um, work in biomaterials, basically designing, it was drug delivery, um, localized drug delivery, which is the in thing now for people with uh, brain tumors. So that was a really very interesting five week internship, very new to engineering at that time. So um, it you know gave me a chance to learn about new techniques. Um, year two was an internship at um, the Washington University in St. Louis. I think that focused more on subcloning, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with or will be in, a, in some time. Uh, the reason I put these is because, you know, a lot of um, students in, in STEM or whichever field you might be are always wondering what they should do. What should the next step be? I feel like as, as important, you know, it is to know what you want. It's more important to know what you don't want. Um, that helps you eliminate a lot of these, these variables and you know that you, you definitely don't want to do that. So right after I think 12th grade was when I thought environmental engineering was something that I was really interested in. And I almost thought that that's something that I want to do. Year three of this internship that I've mentioned there, which was a summer school at the University of Exeter, told me that I definitely don't want to do that. That's something that I'm not interested in. So it's not easy to know what you don't want. It takes time and experience to figure it out. I figured it out very, very um, close to the tail end of my undergrad. But when you know that, you take that out of the list. That helps you make better decisions. So I still did the summer school, and it was interesting. Do I still like the environment? Sure. But do I want to study it? Probably not. So that helped me realize that, you know, that's something I didn't want to do. And I knew for sure that was almost validation to me saying biomedical engineering is something that I definitely want to do. So that's how um, the master's degree came along. Um, I think from year two onwards, I started to learn what Johns Hopkins was all about. And I knew it had the best biomedical engineering program in the country. And um, at that time, that became the dream school. And I know a lot of you, or people who are listening to this later, um, will be aspiring to go to college and you know the college application processes and all of that. And you know we can answer this in the Q&A. Um, but basically, how I look at it is whenever you're deciding 
you know, on which college to go to, you should have two dream schools, two or three at the most. And then you should have about four to five mid-level schools where there's good schools, but they're not your dream schools. And you end it off with at least two or three safety schools. So a lot of you might already know this, but that's something that is very important to do. And getting that list requires a good amount of research to know, you know, what program are you applying for? Is your school, is the school that you're applying to known for the program? A lot of people make mistakes in going for the big names and going for the schools that, that sound popular or that sound good. But at the end of the day, you need to figure out is the program that you're applying for good in that school? That should be the basis of your selection of that school. So that's how, anyway, that's how Johns Hopkins came along. And yes, it was my number one dream school. So it was a big moment when, when the acceptance letter came and things like that. Hopkins was two years, and those were the two of the most challenging years, I would say, so far for me. Challenging in a great sort of way. So um, the first year was um, primarily, you know, first semester rather was primarily getting a lay of the land. And that takes a while for people who are coming in from a different country. Getting to know the system here does take a while. Um, so throughout the two years, it was three things that you were kind of juggling. So you were doing your coursework, which was a lot and very difficult, um, challenging, I would say. Um, I was also a teaching assistant, which was compulsory, which was actually a great experience because I was able to see what undergrad biomedical engineering in, Hop in Hopkins looks like. And for anyone you know who is interested in pursuing biomedical engineering, first of all, you know, contact me and we, we can talk. But um, the kind of education you would get with a biomedical engineering undergrad is pretty fantastic. I worked with a lot of students in undergrad at that time, just as a TA, in the capacity of a TA, but learned that those kids who did their undergrad in BME are kind of set for life. The reason being, I'm sure other engineering special specialities or any other specialty, it doesn't have to be engineering, do have um, you know good attributes to it, but I can talk about BME because that's what I've seen. Um, is the fact that it prepares you for life. You know, you have such a solid foundation of engineering that um, you don't need to typically do anything else afterwards, and that was very interesting to see. So a lot of students I knew then have gone on, you know, to work in different companies in you know biomedical engineering companies and they didn't have to do another degree later well they could if they wanted to but um, that's what i mean by that since this is a talk specific to stem i'll talk about engineering but um, you know a lot of students that i have mentees that i have think that they're interested in stem but they might not be and that's that's great um, you don't have to, everyone doesn't have to do stem um, you know you think you might be interested in it but it's not the be all and end all of everything. So, you know, for a lot of people who then have questions as to should I be doing STEM, should I be not, it's, if you're interested in, in it or not. Not doing STEM is not going to change anything anyway. If you do something that you love and that you're passionate about, that makes it, regardless of whether it's STEM or not. Anyway, so that was um, what was happening at Hopkins. So it was coursework, it was teaching assistants, um, and it was a research, I was a research assistant as well which means that I worked in the lab continuously. So when I when I went there to Baltimore, I thought that I'll be doing a ton of coursework and then just show up in the lab. It turned out to be completely opposite. I was in the lab throughout and showed up for classes. So that was a very interesting experience because I needed to submit a research thesis at the end. That's how I was able to graduate. So those were, again, two of the most challenging, but in a great way, um, two years. And then, so from Baltimore, it brought me to Cincinnati. So in Cincinnati, I worked for a company called MedPace um, as a clinical research associate. Again, I won't get into too much detail, but a clinical research associate is someone who is um, more of an, you know, a monitor or an auditor when it comes to clinical trials. So I used to travel to different sites in the country, in the US, going to different hospitals or going to, to different clinics who were conducting clinical trials telling them how they should do it. So I used to go check their work, basically, because um, they are the ones who are interacting with patients and they are doing all of these clinical trials. But we, as a company, MedPace was a clinical research organization. So we had to make sure that they were doing it correctly. In clinical trials, it becomes very tricky because there's 
you know, primarily ethics, um, primarily pace, you know, pacing yourself in a way that you're not going overboard with the patients. Um, you know, it's, it's all a very fine line. So as a clinical research associate, I was able to travel, which I love. I still do. Um, so it really used to be, you know, I used to come back from Los Angeles one day and the next day fly out to Florida as, as expansive as that. And that's very exciting to me. And I do miss that in my new job. But the reason I moved to the new job is also because I felt like at MedPace, yes, I did deal with patient data, but I didn't, didn't deal with patients themselves. So the way I look at clinical research is, you know, the whole point was to get a 360 de degree view of it. So when I was at Hopkins working as a research assistant that we talked about, um, the PI or the principal investigator that I was working with was a neurologist. So I worked at the clinic quite a bit. So I was able to see his patients. So that's one angle of clinical research, where in the lab you do regular research, but it's patient oriented. So that happened at Hopkins. MedPace was more the other side. It was the regulatory side of it, where um, you know you worked as an auditor or monitor or whatever. The one leftover side was actually working with patients, which I thought if I did that would complete the circle, would be a more 360 degree view of clinical research. And that's what got me to the Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, late 2018. And I've been there ever since. You know, working in a hospital is, is very exciting. Um, I see patients almost every day. Of course, now COVID has thrown a wrench into all of those things. But typically, my day of work would be um, working with, with patients. Um, so I work in the division of pulmonary medicine, which has everything to do with the lung. Um, so we have kids. We have adults too, but I'll speak about the kids who come in um, to the hospital. And we do a certain trial for them. So it's a trial that basically helps us realize what's happening in their lungs. So we do an, um, a modified MRI scan for them. Um, a modified MRI is, you know, they'll be in an MRI machine and we ask them to breathe in this particular gas called xenon. Xenon is something that is, you know, colorless, odorless. Um, it's, it's extremely safe, but it helps us realize what's happening in the lung. So to explain it better, it's basically, it helps us, it lights up the lung. So we're able to see exactly what's happening, I guess. If anyone has specific questions about like a day or at work, I can talk about it later. But um, so, yes, so I see patients and I feel like now I feel a little more fulfilled in terms of, okay, I know what clinical research is all about. If, um, you know, you guys are interested in reading Malcolm Gladwell's books, he talks about a concept called 10,000 hours. So it takes you 10,000 hours to actually know a subject fully. That's very interesting when you come to think of it. Anyway, I'm at the hospital now, um, totally love it. It's very exciting. I do a ton of different things. Um, it's not only patient work. I still do a lot of regulatory work. Um, I still do a lot of leadership and management work. So it's been good. So I think that kind of covers my experiences, but we can get into some more detail depending on what questions you might have. And then it brings me to mentorship and volunteer activities. So. Yes, I have been doing STEM officially, educational-wise, since 2010. But way before that, I realized that teaching or mentoring comes very easily to me. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. Actually, it's a toss-up as to which I like more, mentoring or STEM. So I decided to combine the both and be a STEM mentor. And that was as easy as it sounded. So um, a STEM mentor is someone who helps, who guides, who advises other students in STEM. And my definition of a mentor is someone who is just there to be a sounding board. I am not necessarily making any decisions for you, but when you're in school, when you're trying to figure things out and when you think that STEM is something that you want to do, I'm going to be there to hear you out and to give you some sort of advice and my advice is based on my experiences. I feel like the more people hear about other people's experiences, they'll, they'll know that if they can do it, you can do it. That's what I've been trying to do as a STEM mentor. That's all it takes. Yes, the, the calls with different students take a while, but it's just kind of getting you on board 
and just seeing you through the entire process. Um, I don't like for my mentoring associations to be very, very, um, you know, small in duration. Um, some organizations have a very strict policy of just one hour a month. I don't think that works. It takes time, so I'd like to give it that time. Um, again, specific questions about any of these I can answer later. But the organizations that I've listed there, which are many and quite a mouthful, um, are all the organizations that I've partnered with and um, I'm, I'm a mentor for them. So it's given me great experience. It started in 2008 and I continue to do it even now. Um, if y'all are interested in doing specific mentorship programs, these are the ones that you can definitely look into, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that a little later. Um, so all of these organizations I've worked with over the last 12, 13 years, um, building what is called a foundation in STEM mentoring. Slowly over the years, it's become a women in STEM mentoring um, component of what it is. But I'm, you know, I still mentor any student who needs it. So that's, I would say, and all of this is voluntary, of course. Um, it makes it more interesting and it makes it more fun. Uh, you know, your perspectives are very, very straight. It makes you happy. That's why you do it. Which sounded like advice. So let's go to the third one. Advice for next generation in STEM. So a lot of you might be considering STEM. Um, you think that you might be interested in, you might be or not. But I think in terms of advice, I would definitely say building a strong technical foundation is very, very important. Someone asked me the other day, if I were to go back to my previous self, what would I do differently? Um, and I said that if I, when I was in school, yes, we learned Java, I think. And in college, we were shown what is C, C++, but it didn't help much. I would go back and learn a little more programming languages because it, it would have helped me more in college or here at Hopkins. Um, and I see that because biomedical engineering to me is biology meets engineering, meets computer science, meets clinical work, meets, you know, patient care. And a big part of it is computer science. So I wish I'd done that more. So anyway, to build a strong technical foundation, it doesn't have to be only computer science. Whatever you're interested in, if you are someone who wants to be a physicist, your physics should be very, very strong, as simple as that. You should want to seek additional experiences, you know, um, and that's why I talked about my, um, internships. It's very important. You can't be laid back at this time. This is the time when you have to go out there. Um, you know, people trying to tend to take it easy. Yes, the summers are fun. I love them too, but split it out so that you're also learning new things. Take the initiative. There are so many of these mentoring organizations that I've list, list, listed up there. Um, you need to go there. You need to register yourself. If you ask for help, you'll get it. Um, and, you know, I've been a strong advocate of that. If, otherwise, I wouldn't know whether you need help or not. When you're assigned a mentor, be very mindful of their time. Be mindful of people's time in general, but be mindful of the mentor's time. And make sure your communication is very clear. What do you want from this association? That's something that's really important. You know, when you send out emails, when you have a discussion, when you're meeting with your mentor, keep it clear, keep it concise. Communication in general, in life, communication with clarity is very important. Networking, this is the time. This is the time to build your, you know, LinkedIn profile, build your CV. I update my CV almost once a week, even now. That's, that's going to tell your prospective employer, that's going to tell your current employer, that's going to tell everyone what you're doing, how much you do, what you do. Keeping your CV up to date and creating one right now, if you haven't done it, Sunday's, Sunday night task would be to create one and keep it up to date. Um, and I guess the last piece of advice, so to speak, is a lot of you know, students who graduate from, from STEM programs very easily dismiss entry-level positions. And that's not a good thing. You're just out of college. You cannot be the CEO of the company. You, I'd love for you to be that, and you will be that in a bit, but not immediately. You have to start at the bottom. And that's how you, you learn, you gain more experiences, and that's how you 
go to the next level. So never dismiss entry level positions. It's giving you all of the training that you need to thrive in the company or in the organization. So that's another piece of advice that I definitely like to share. So again, this was just a little bit of um, these three specific points. I'll end now and take a breath myself. And um, you know, we can open it up to any questions that anyone has. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Daisy Razu. Uh, we, ha uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, just okay. a minute. Thank you for uh, giving a nice presentation about your experiences and the advice. Um, my first question to you is, uh, what do you love about your current job and what do you find the most challenging? Mm. So what do I love about it? I love the fact that it's so interdisciplinary. Um, when I, and this gives me a chance to talk a little bit more about the work that I do, but it's interdisciplinary. So when we do a study visit, what I love is that people who come in to get the work done to and you know to have an entire study visit have all such different varied backgrounds. You'll see a biomedical engineer, you'll see a physicist, you might see a chemist, you might see someone with clinical research experience, you might see a physician who has an MD. And we all come together to make that scan happen the MRI scan that I talked about. I love that. I do scans almost every other day. And to see everyone come together to make that happen is very incredible. Um, what I also love to see, what I love about the job is the fact that every day is different. You know, a lot of people, when I interview them to join our team, ask, what does a typical day look like? It's very difficult to answer. Um, but I think that's really exciting. The fact that you don't know what your day is going to be. Every day is going to be different. The reason I say that is I meet with different families every day. You know, there are some families who are very business-like, who, you know, just want to hear about the trial. Okay, get it done. This, that, question, answer, done. There are, and you know, you, you kind of go with the flow. There are others who are very chatty and who want to talk about their day and who want to talk about their life. And, you can't cut them off. They're here to do your clinical trials. They're here to do your research visit. How do you gauge these interactions? How do you how do you say, um, okay, today is going to be this? You can't say that. It depends on the patient's family. Every day is different in that way. Every day there are new questions that come up about the trial. Isn't that exciting? To me, when a cl when a clinical trial is set up, you know, you have the protocol, you have everything. You know, People think, okay, I'm going to follow that exactly. But no, there are so many questions that come up every day that make you go back and rethink the protocol. Is that right? Can there be something that we can do better? That's what is exciting. So I love that about the job. And it's very exciting to work with a team who, you know, wants to do better every day. That's what you, that's what you strive to do. And that's very interesting. The challenge is, so I work a lot with the NICU population. The NICU is the neonatal ICU. So there are basically babies that are born today that might not make it tomorrow. Or there are babies that are born today that don't live more than a couple of months or are in the NICU for years on end. So that's very difficult to see. Um, and I'm approaching their families in the NICU in that atmosphere talking about a clinical trial, which seems really trivial at that time. That's very challenging because here they are, the baby is born, they're sick, they don't even know whether they'll make it. And I go and approach them about a clinical trial. It feels wrong sometimes to me, honestly, but it's going to help the baby. That's what you need to think of it. It's challenging because at that time, they're going through so many things. And here I am saying, yeah, you know, do you want to participate in a study? It pays you $50. It doesn't feel right. But more and more experiences with these families has taught me to gauge them better. If they feel that, if I feel that they're someone, it's probably not a good time to talk now. I know enough to step back and come back later or to even tell the physician, you know what, listen, it might not work with them. So that does get challenging. Um, another challenge I would say is, you know, when we schedule a clinical trial like this or a study visit like this, I call them study visits because they're two hours each. Um, I work with the patient's family for about an hour doing 
informed consent and you know paperwork and things like that and then they're in the scanner for about another hour so all of this requires a lot of pre study visit effort to get all of this ready for when they come a lot of the times they say that they'll they'll be there for the study but they don't show up so you can't do anything about that can i call and yell at them no can i be frustrated and angry no it's not going to help anyone but yes you do get frustrated sometimes because you worked so much towards setting it up and they don't show well you have to remember that you're working in a hospital you are working with patients who have different conditions that they're dealing with if they can't make it there's probably for a reason so you have to be very very persevering you need to be very tenacious you need to try again you need to try again because you know it will work to work for them it will help them it's pretty cool that um, in your field there's no such thing as typical day like it keeps changing it is um okay. what are the common mistakes you have seen young women make in their journey and they don't realize and why do you think that there are less women in stem Now the second question is is let me answer that first why do i think there's there are fewer women so my initiative to do these talks or to talk to more mentees and to talk to more students is to exactly find that out i feel that the numbers are very very there's a lot of disparity in the numbers you know and um that's not a good thing the reasons i could think of are a lot of people when they a lot of women when they think of stem and when they see the numbers can put you off and that's completely fair um you know the percentage itself is is completely off and that should not want to make you step back a lot of people in my experience again who i've talked to who i've said why are you not doing this if there's something that you're interested in the answer has been am i even going to make it hopefully in this lifetime we're able to change this thought process where even if there are triple the men that who are doing this um are there continuing to be in stem that's not going to stop you from doing what you want to do that's the number one point are women not good in computer science of course they are are they not good in um engineering of course they are um why are they not going forward and doing it it's because it's a very simple reason you see other people doing it and you see a workforce of men there it should be that if they can do it we can and when i say they i don't even mean other men i mean any one the faster we get rid of this men and women and And on different standards, the better it's going to be. And um, a lot of young students who I've talked to have expressed this, saying that will I be able to? So in my own way, even if it's a small way, I'm trying to change that by saying it doesn't matter who's already there. It's matter. It what matters is how much you can do, and what you are passionate about. That's one of the reasons. It's nothing to do with skill. it's nothing to do with capability it's about going out there and doing it regardless you know um a lot of people think are are overwhelmed by that or you know you see stats everywhere that says okay you know in an entrance exam or in um, in sats or gres we see that you know randomly 67% of the of the boys do better in math really how are you calculating that so the lesser we think about what other people are saying the less that we think about these percentages and the more we focus on what it is that we are passionate about you can go out there and do whatever it is that you want a lot of boys again i i, I don't like to specifically differentiate but are we saying that 97% of the of men are great at computer science no certainly not 
it's not about the percentages it's not about skill it's not about capability it's about you going out there and doing it yes the numbers are very very different and we're hoping to change that but the organizations like this groups like this is going to help people take up stem careers take up stem education and now if you've noticed in the last 10 years the numbers are changing which is great the numbers are changing because women are saying i'm going to go out there and do whatever it is that i want to do so and the chain reaction what i call is if one woman goes out there and does it she sets an example for so many people and they are going to look and say hey she did it i can do it so again this question is a great question it needs to be talked about but given to me i can talk about it for an hour so i will not but um i think it's 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 positive to think about it now in this day and age where you know nothing is impossible um for anyone who really wants to do it so these kind of um you know like the organization is still, it's called stem for everyone there you go it's not specific that's what I like about it. Um, and it's a matter of, you know, going out there and doing whatever you, whatever you can. Um, so that was the second part of the question. The first one was, um, what was that again? Can you repeat it, please? So it's very inspiring that you're mentoring many young girls who are getting into STEM. Um, having a mentor is amazing because you learn, you learn so many things from them and they help you make good decisions and offer encouragement. Did you have a mentor in your life? Um, how did she or he help you get where you are? Yeah, surprisingly, I think the mute, the mute for me is, is locked. So I had to ask for that. Um, I think, um, I was lucky enough. Uh, my dad is a scientist and uh, he's a biochemist. So I think I grew up with science at home. Um, and it was interesting because every time I, I had, you know, when I started learning chemistry, for example, um, he would basically set up a small chemistry lab at home that I could practice with, you know, very safe. Um, and so there was a lot of influence um, of science right from the beginning, and it was it was at home. Um, so yes, my father, you know, instilled all of that in me. He never specifically said that I have to do science, but you know, watching him be in the lab all day that was that was the lab was an intriguing place. It was one of those places that you know uh, he used to work in for hours on end, and he used to come back from the lab. So that was a that was a big um, influence. And the nice thing about my dad is that at the end of it, he said, you know, you don't even have to do any of this. Um, you should you should do um, what you want to do. And he asked me, you know, <clears throat> I remember I was in the 12th grade and he said, you know, we were talking about engineering at that time. And um, I said, I, I, I wanted to do it. Like, I'm the one saying I want to do it. And he said, really? Are you sure? You know? Maybe there's something else more fun. And I said, well, you're supposed to be the scientist, but oh well. Um, so yes, so he was an influence. Um, um, one of our other close family friends is um, it was a neuroscientist. And um, she was one of the foremost neuroscientists um, in India, still is. Um, her influence also has been big. Um, I was asked this question recently and made me think at that time, at that specific time, um, she was an influence, especially in the 11th and 12th grade. And um, she went ahead and did things that were, you know, uh, you know, ahead of time. And I was witness to all of that. And that was very exciting. So I've learned a lot from her how to be a woman in STEM. Um, and, you know, to see that you can, to see her, you know, break barriers and, and just keep going one step at a time. So all these influences, I think, you know, came together um, to me for me to make a decision that I want to do STEM. Of course, throughout the way, there were other people who went in and out. Um, in terms of a mentor, because I know the question was, did I have a mentor? I would consider both of these people as mentors. But um, when I was at Hopkins, there was another person who, again, is a woman in STEM, um, who I think I got a lot of advice from, and I still do even till date. So 
there's no age where you feel i don't need a mentor anymore you know that should not be there you always need a mentor um you know the more we think we know it all it doesn't work you are constantly asking questions you're all constantly you know gaining advice that's all good things um you know only if you ask for help will you get it so i continue to have different mentors in different capacities now um for different things in life it doesn't have to be only stem you know um so all the time yep that's pretty cool how do you balance your work as a clinic research coordinator and a mentor yeah that's a good question so i work um all day in clinical research and then when i come back in the evenings is usually when i have my menti calls um or in the weekend sometimes too i think i don't look at it as work for me that's the fun part you remember when we were you know much younger used to go out and play in the evenings and everyone used to look forward to that so i look forward to these mentoring associations that's what makes it fun for me so i don't think of it as work um so after the days of work clinical research wise i look forward to coming home and doing all of this um the weekends too you know it's something that's fun because i feel like at the end of the day you know that you're helping someone um you know some of us are very fortunate to have people around us in stem who are who have helped us in the past or who help us now but a lot of people don't have that so it's not a given that you do one of my longest standing associations with a mentee um you know was when i met her when she was in the ninth standard and she didn't have anyone to ask these questions to because her parents were did other awesome things they didn't do stem at that time so that's why i say mentoring is so important because you're able to help people who don't have access to these kind of experiences to these kind of influences that's what i want to do um and that's why i'd like to do it because you're helping someone and that i come to realize is something that i thoroughly enjoy doing um and that's how i'm able to balance it um because it's not work to me it's it's an exciting it's a very fulfilling experience um you know and over the weekends too it's a matter of okay i'm i'm still going to do fun stuff um i'm not going to be working but i'm going to be having these conversations that will hopefully change someone's life so that's how i'm able to balance it um what are the major takeaways from your mentoring journey um what challenges did you encounter and uh what advice would you give to someone pursuing a career similar to yours so i think um the challenges from mentoring is um i think just basic communication and i'm hoping to change that sometime soon so you know when i'm first introduced to a student through whichever organization or through now word of mouth um it takes me a while to figure out what stage they are in so um you know because it's difficult when when you know you're talking to a student i i want to know everything about them so far and when i say everything about them i mean their education their interests their passions their internships all of that um sometimes that becomes a challenge because it's difficult to go back and think of everything you've done but if you're in the 11th grade or if you're in the 12th grade you have to tell your mentor everything that you've done because all of that goes into the cv all of that goes into college applications i need to know about it i understand both ways because i know students have done so many things in the past it's difficult for them to to um uh, you know recollect it and that's why i think cvs are important because when you apply to college that's the only thing you've done that's the only thing you have you have your school so everything that you've done in school has to be there um and that's why it's important so that communication gets challenging sometimes because a lot of students you know much later in the fifth or sixth conversation says oh i've also done this well we should have talked about that before so what i want to do which i'm we'll start in some time is to basically i'm i'm going to create this form that um it's a fillable form with a lot of drop down menus and everything that helps the students answer the questions that i need to be a better mentor so um ask them about you know make them go back and think of every experience that they've had or every stem project that they've done so that i know about it and then when i go and say okay i'm mentoring this student i can just pull up that form and see everything that they've done um i should maybe start doing that form soon um 
but I think that's going to help fix that problem. Um, you know, and you can take your time in filling it out. Um, that way you can, you know, search your brain and, and fill everything out. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that's a challenge that I face. Um, what was the second part of the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, the second part of the question uh, was like, what advice would you give to someone interested in pursuing a career similar to yours? OK, thank you. So I think um, so if I look at my career, it's biomedical engineering, but it doesn't have to be. It can be biotechnology as well. Um, and once you're done with that for clinical research, I'll talk about clinical research here in the US um, because that's what I'm familiar with and that's what I have done. Um, so when I had to get into clinical research, um, I, not, I did not have any prior experience, so to speak. So MedPace, the company that I talked about earlier, um, actually has a very, very comprehensive training program. It has a training program for about six months. So you join as an employee and then you go through the training program. And I think that tremendously helped me even do the job that I currently do now. Um, so I would say find a clinical research organization. If clinical research is something that you're interested in, find a clinical research organization that has a good training program and that can actually help you um, understand what clinical research is all about. MedPace is something that really helped me, so I always talk about that. And then you decide in clinical research which aspect do you want to focus on. Do you want to focus on basic, you know, um, basic research where you're working on patient data or where you're working with patient samples, not patient data, patient samples. If you want to do that, you need to be able to identify that you want to do that. And that comes with working in a lab. So depending on which stage of life you're in, if you're someone who's interested in clinical research or if you want to take the path that I did, you know, when you're looking for internships, you look for internships in a clinical research lab. A clinical research lab is different from a research lab. Um, so clinical research is patient oriented. So you would want to work in a lab to see if that's something that you want to do. You would apply to a company or do an internship in a company that allows you to be a monitor, an auditor, a regulatory person to see if that's the angle of clinical research that you're interested in. And you would work potentially or do an internship in a hospital to see if patient care is something that you're interested in. So it's a matter of figuring out which of these three. Again, you don't have to figure it out necessarily. I have not figured it out. I like all three equally. Um, I'm just doing the patient care one now. Do I have a preference? Not really. It's exciting. All three are exciting. So I would definitely, my advice is depending on whichever stage of life you are in. If you are someone who's applying to college, you would want to do internships even in school. If you're someone already in college, you definitely should do internships while you're in college. And if you're someone who's just out of college, then you look for specific kind of jobs that will really help you um, grow in that specific field. At that time, you, you, you know, it should be as if you have blinkers where it's very focused. During college, you can figure out all these kind of things, but you have to at one point put all of your efforts into one specific thing. So even if it's clinical research, that's something that's that's very important. And then you figure out, you know, which you like better than the other. Uh, do you have a favorite book that you read and a quote that caught your attention? I think a quote would be, I think what Michelle Obama said, which I, I, I don't remember verbatim, but it says that, you know, success is not how much money you make, but the number of lives you can touch, something to that effect. And I sincerely believe in it. Um, you know, it's very fulfilling when you are able to help a person in need. It's very fulfilling to be a guidance force or be an advisor to someone who really needs it. Another thing I truly believe is that be the person who you wanted when you were younger. That's something that I think more often than not, I'm realizing that's very true. It doesn't have to be only education wise. It can be personal situations. It can be um, a myriad of things, but always think of that. When you were younger, what did you want? Be that person. Um, 
that's something that I really believe in. Um, a book that I really enjoy, which I, you know, advise people to read, which is it makes for a really good and fun read. It's called The Telltale Brain. Um, it's by this author called V.S. Ramachandran. It talks about the brain in a very fantastic. Um, it talks about different concepts in a very easy to understand, yet very intriguing, very exciting fashion. Um, you know, regardless of what background you have, I definitely recommend reading that book. Um, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is another book that I thoroughly enjoyed. So I would definitely recommend um, both of those books. Yeah, I've heard of um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Mm -hmm. So uh, for females who are now starting their careers in STEM, uh, what skills should they have to help them on their journey? So again, it depends on where you are in life. So I think um, skills to have right from the beginning, if you're in school, college, whatever it is, right from the beginning is, um, again, you should have a strong technical foundation, which means that if you decide to do engineering, for example, your engineering foundation should be very, very strong. And that would mean, um, you know, focusing in, in your classes, learning everything that you can and applying it. A lot of the places help you apply everything that you've learned through internships. So that's, I keep coming back to internships because that really helps. Um, other skills that you should have are, you should be able to identify when you know something and when you don't know something. So I find it easy to decide, to say if someone asks me a very specific question, I find it easy to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll think about it and get back to you. I feel a lot of people make the mistake of trying to answer it in some way that they can or wanting to come across as if they know the answer to that. You don't have to do that. That's in a way a skill um, to know what you know and to know what you don't know. I think that's something that's very, very important. Um, and I definitely, that is a piece of advice that I'd like to give. Um, you don't have to know everything um, and you should have enough confidence to say that you don't know it. That is a skill one should have for sure. Um, I also feel, again, in terms of, you know, computer science or um, other programming languages, it's, it's good to know a bunch. It really helps. Again, all of this is from experience. It's not in any book, but it, it, it would have really benefited me if I knew more of this. Um, and I think skills can mean any kind of thing. It can mean technical skills. We've talked about that. It could mean um, leadership skills. So leadership skills would be, you know, are you able to lead a team? You're Never in your life will you come across a situation where you might not have to lead it. It always comes up one way or the other. Those skills are very important to build right from the beginning. You know, even if you're doing a project in school, take the role of a leader, see what that's like. Yes, that's a lot of responsibility, but it also teaches you so much. That's very important. Um, does that mean you should not work by alone or you should not work by yourself? Not at all. I enjoy doing both. Um, you should have the flexibility to do both. Some projects in, it, in work, it could be whatever work, require to work alone. Some projects require you to work as a team. So being able to do both is very important. You can't do one or the other. So that's really important in terms of leadership. Another skill that one should have is, you know, just being mindful of time in terms of organization. Um, when you are in a fast paced job like this, being organized is very, very important. Um, again, it could be specifically for STEM or not. Um, when I when we talk about STEM, you know, you start talking specifically about science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, but these are true for for anything that you might take take up. Um, but in STEM specifically, I feel a good technical knowledge of whatever it is that you want to do should be there right from the beginning. And that is always enhanced by the more that you learn, by the internships that you do, by networking with, with other people in the field. I think that's a skill too. You know, you need to know how to network with people. Um, LinkedIn, that's why I said it's very, very important. It helps you create that base where from which you can reach out to people, even for internships. And a lot of students that I work with, you know, 
find it hard to reach out to people, writing to them, saying, listen, I really want to work in your lab. But how do you say that? That takes some experience. That's what I come in and help with. You know, just going through an email and saying, okay, does this make sense? Yes. And you should never fear what are these people going to say when they see my email. If I was a person on the other end, I would be very happy if a student reaches us and says, you know, I really like the work you're doing because of X, Y, Z reason. And this is why I want to do it. So a skill would be, you know, in reaching out to people, um, to be able to do that effectively, I think is very important. Thank you for answering our questions. Uh, we have a few questions which were submitted through the form, the registration form, and okay. from the audience. So the first question is from Maria Neverett. Um, her question is, uh, what helped you move from a traditional STEM career to be an advocate for girls and women in STEM? Can you repeat the first part of it? What, what was my... What helped you to move from a traditional STEM career to be an advocate for girls and women in STEM? Okay. Um, I don't think I moved. I just added the STEM mentoring on. Um, so I still do both. Um, I'm still doing, uh, I'm, I have a career in STEM, but I'm also doing this. Um, I think what got me interested in doing STEM mentoring like I said, started way back in 2008. Um, I participated in the National Science Foundation Global Challenge Award. Um, I participated in 2007, won it that year, and then they asked whether, you know, can I be a mentor to other groups who are participating in that project. That project basically got different people from different parts of the world together in an online format, helped them build a project together, and then if you were to get selected, you go and present at the University of Vermont. And that's what I did with my team in 2007. Um, and that's what got me interested because at that time I was working with students who were in STEM. I was still in the 11th grade or something like that. I worked with them to develop these projects. That's when I realized that STEM mentoring is something that's so much fun to me. It comes easily to me. And I like to see how that progress kind of comes along, you know, at first you're you're given this group, you're working with them, um, you know, and you're you're seeing how they think. That's very interesting to me. I think of it in a certain way, but imagine if I find someone in this group who thinks of the same idea in a different sort of way. Isn't that exchange of knowledge? Isn't that getting them to think of how else you can you can look at this problem? It started off there, and then I was lucky enough to um, volunteer a little bit at the Augusta International Foundation in Bangalore. And there um, I worked with two students and I helped them develop um, a biodiesel project, like literally from scratch, a distillation unit and everything. And it was very interesting to me because I knew what was happening and they knew what was happening, but they were thinking of it differently. So it's a question of, OK, I'll ask you a question. You think about it and you get back to me. But if you don't know, I can give you clues for you to get there. And then it's a matter of their ideas coming in. And sometimes when you don't know an answer to something, you think of it, you'll come up with a you know, brand new fantastic idea that actually worked, but no one else would have thought about. That kind of spark is very interesting to me. So I'd love you know, for students to tell me what they think. Um, and that's how it started off. And then I said, if I'm able to do this or if I'm able to help students who, you know, are interested in STEM, want to do more and want to apply to college, want to apply to, um, you know, specific courses at school, how can I help them? I know college applications are a very tedious and very tiring process. Um, and, you know, it can be very stressful. I want to help people in that front make it you know to make it a less stressful process and that's how it became what it did um, long answer to a short question but yeah the next question is by connie huang and her question is how do you deal with uh, imposter syndrome in uh, stem right i actually don't <laughs> um that's a that's a simple answer to that i think um and it, 
I think, you know, when you share your experiences, when you um, are able to tell someone exactly, you know, this is what I've done. Um, I don't think anything else, you know, comes into the picture. The area that I'm working in is easy because, you know, I don't have to prepare for it. Whenever I talk to someone, I don't prepare for it because I'm just talking about my experiences. That's the difference. You know, at work, it's a little, little different because you're working on someone's project or you're working with other people. Here in STEM mentoring, all I say is my experiences because I feel that can help. So that's all it is. It's very clear cut. It's very, this is what it is. And to be a sounding board is, is not difficult at all because you're learning from other people's experiences and you're helping them through it. So I think that's what it is. Oh, that's cool. Um, the next question is by Alexander Shave and her question is, what is the advice uh, that you always tell your mentors? I think you've already answered that, but is there anything you would like to add to it? Actually, yeah, that's a good question because it's advice to mentors itself, which is interesting. I think if you want to be a STEM mentor, we've talked enough about being a STEM mentee and how to you know, go out there and register yourself with these Actually, organizations. Uh, uh, mentees. Oh, mentees? Yeah. Yeah, I think we've talked about that, you know, um, and just to summarize it, it's basically you have to take the initiative, go and sign up to, there are so many organizations in the world that offer this. You have to go and find it. That's how you're able to get a new mentor. Um, that's how you're able to learn from all of these experiences. So you have to take the initiative. This is experience for life. It's ne nothing is ever going to come and fall into your lap. You have to go look for it. So that's my number one advice to mentees. You, you know, take the initiative, go find someone who can help you. Networking is very important. LinkedIn, CV, all of these need to be updated. And know what you want and know what you don't want. Both of those, very, very important. Those are very basic when you come to think of it. It doesn't have to be STEM at all. Um, it can be anything. But for STEM mentees, I would say, if you're interested in STEM, you need to be able to tell the mentor or you need to be able to tell yourself why you're interested in STEM. That's the first question. What is exciting to you about STEM? And then, you know, Go and reach out and get some help in terms of um, anyone who can, whose experience that you can learn from. So that's, we've covered that in detail, uh, but just as a summary, this is, this is a good way to, to talk about that. Uh, since you brought it up, uh, like, uh, what advice would you give to uh, mentors? To mentors? I think to mentors, um, you know, if you're someone who is, who's interested or who's passionate about um, mentoring um, young students, I think my advice would, as a STEM mentor myself, would be to figure out exactly what the STEM mentee wants from this association. Sometimes, you know, communication can go wrong in so many ways, which is not either person's fault, but to figure out from the mentee what exactly they want. Do they want help in college applications? Do they want help in just advice um, in terms of, um, you know, should I do this? Should I do not do that? Do they want advice in just, or do they just want to listen to your journey? You need to figure that, that out. And being a mentor, you need to take that initiative to also ask these questions. Um, you know, as far as the mentee is telling you, mentee is telling you is a great thing, but you have to ask these questions because otherwise the association is not going to be fruitful. It's going to be kind of all over the place. So, um, you know, you need to, the STEM mentor has to do that. Another advice to STEM mentors would be patience. I try to apply that quite a bit. Just be very, very patient. These are students who are, are learning. Um, these are students who have reached out to you wanting help. You have to be patient with them. Um, and you need to teach them so many things, not only about STEM, but um, your experiences should show how to deal with situations, how to deal correctly with situations. So um, an advice definitely for the mentors would to be patience. Very important. Takes you a long way. Thank you for taking time out to answer our questions. Uh, that's all we have for now. Um, okay. If anyone else has any qu other question, please drop in a message in the chat.
And Sahana, even later, if any questions come up or, you know, any more clarifications or anything, you have my email. So feel free to reach out um, and, you know, anyone else to listen to this, have more specific questions, want some advice on any of these things. Again, feel free to share my email ID. This is what I do and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I don't think we have any questions from the audience, okay. so I guess we can close for today. Thank you so much uh, for answering our questions and uh, thank you for the audience um, to listen to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope all of you stay safe in these uh, unprecedented times.